And to me, if you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching them. in this series is the patterns of mature deer and kind of the way I've kind of always envisioned is the deer really has three distinct patterns. It's a bedding pattern, it's a feeding pattern, it has a breeding pattern. And at different times of the year those are going to dictate how you set up on him and how mm -hmm. you're hunting him. So I think I know what your answer would be but in your opinion like what's the most important out of those three? Bedding pattern, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And in your opinion, when a buck's kind of deciding where he beds, mm -hmm. what is he looking for? Well, uh, that's a pretty complex question. I mean, it depends a lot on your terrain mm -hmm. and uh, wind direction, things like that. Um, he's looking for a place where nobody goes. And uh, I shouldn't say nobody. There's no place where nobody goes. Mm -hmm but a place that gets disturbed very little by people. I call it like an overlooked spot. I mean, we just talked about a buck I shot out here, 75 yards from the road. Well, nobody goes over there. They all go way back, you know, or they go a little ways and over to the side. Uh, they find those little overlooked spots, but you still need the terrain that a deer needs in that spot. So what is that terrain that he's looking for? Um, cover or whatever. Yeah, thick cover. Um, you know, they, they like to, uh, in this swamp terrain, for instance, uh, people think they're in the middle of thick. They usually aren't. Big bucks are on the edge of it. And they like the downwind edges. They like to look out into open areas and have the thick to their back with the wind coming out of the thick. And when you start getting into that, now you can start predicting where they're going to be based on the wind. You know, because the wind's going to be coming out of the thick and they're going to be on the edge, you know. How does that change in, as, you, as you've seen in hill country? I mean, when you're hunting hill country, how are they bedding in that? Well, in, in hill country, they're bedding on leeward sides. And uh, the big bucks almost always are. Um, every time I find one, he's in a leeward edge. And again, it's usually an overlooked one. I find a lot of them right by the road. I can think of one uh, public property I go into where I go in a low area, and then you got 400 acres. Well, the biggest buck on that property is almost always on the ridge overlooking the parking lot because he can see the parking lot from, the, from where he beds. So you can't really go up the hill and hunt him. And you have to go way out and come around and come back and get him from a side. And nobody does that. So he doesn't get harassed there. You know, um, but it's a leeward side. And uh, they still like the thickness. Um, what I think they really like the most is thick above and open below. They like to get right up against that thick and look below them. Um, where I've helped people with uh, land management, if we put thick from about the one-third elevation up, they really get the bedding on those uh, leeward sides. And they'll bed right in that edge. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Do you think that a deer is traditionally bedding in one area? As far as, he might have multiple beds in an area, but do you think he's in one kind of core area? Or do you think that that changes? Well, I think it changes per deer and, and per age class. Um, I see older deer, um, which is probably the opposite of what most people are thinking, kind of lock into areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're easier to hunt in bedding areas because they do lock in an area and it's hard to kick them out of them. Um, where younger bucks are more sporadic, moving around a lot. Um, but I do think most of your big bucks got a lot of bedding areas. Um, there's a lot of places they bed based on like uh, seasonal, like food or rut or those type things, but there's certain beds that they use a lot, which I call primary. And I think a buck probably has 10, 15 of those, you know, and, and that's kind of what I key in on. Gotcha. <clears throat> Do you ever try to hunt bucks coming back to bed? Because I know most mm -hmm. of what you do is hunting bucks leaving their beds. Mm -hmm. When do you think it's acceptable to go in and hunt a buck kind of coming back to his bed? Well, uh, I do hunt them like that, but I'm not nearly as, as successful as I am in the evening when they're leaving. And uh, there's some reasons for that. Um, bucks go into those beds paranoid. They want to check that area out. They circle downwind and they come in wind to nose. So the way they come into those beds is different every time. 
and uh, I've observed this a lot. And outside of that rut window, most of the bucks I see approach bedding do it before daylight. I'll get in there in the morning and try slipping up and you hear the buck get up out of the beds and take off. Where in the evening, you know he's there. And they always seem to get up before dark and move in the evening. It's not like they're, what people might think, so nocturnal that they later go dark. They'll move. It's a short window, but they move. Uh, even early season, I mean, I have uh, a lot of success, you know, in September and stuff when other people are saying it's too hot, deer aren't moving and such. They move, it's just the amount of distance and how close you pushed out that envelope. Gotcha. So let's talk about identifying those beds. I think one thing I've seen on your site, on the hunting beast, is a lot of guys tend to get excited when they find a bed and they'll kind of find mm -hmm. the first five beds that they see and they'll kind of set up on them and then it's like, well, this doesn't work because they sit there for three or four days and nothing happens or whatever. I've dealt with that a little bit, trying mm -hmm. to kind of like understand what to be looking for. How do you know when you found a, a good bed? That yeah, you, honestly, you know, I struggle with uh, with showing people how to how to find it. I can see it, look at it, and tell you, hey, this is good. And I think when you start finding that stuff, you're going to know it. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of guys will find that one bed that's worn in, and they think they got it made. They think, okay, I got them. But what they're not putting into perspective is when, when is that deer bedding there? What time frame of the year? All that stuff comes into play. Um, and if it's one single bed, I get a little leery of that. I've had a few uh, single beds that paid off real well. As a matter of fact, my biggest buck came from a, a lone bed. But the majority of the bucks I get are out of bedding areas where there's like 20 or 30 beds, maybe even more in a small condensed area, that tells you that the buck's there a lot and he's moving a lot based on the wind. So he's not there on one specific wind. Um, when you find a bed that's up against an obstacle, like a tree in the back or something, that's telling you that that obstacle, the wind is coming from that direction. He'll put his back against that obstacle and look downwind. So if it's one bed, he's only bedding there if that wind's shooting gotcha. the other way. I guess one thing I find is like, do you think guys mistake like, oh, I found a bunch of beds for doe bedding? Like, do you think mm -hmm. they see that and if there's no rut sign there, there's yeah. no rubs, it's like, well, that must be doe bedding. Right, and, and you know, does bed in circles. Mm -hmm. They bed all looking in a different direction and guys will see all those beds and think they're in a primary bedding area when they're really on doe bedding. But um, there's big differences. Um, does tend to bed on the outskirts of those buck bedding areas and they bed in more open areas and they're using their eyes noses and ears of all the animals so they feel a little safer when you find a mature bucks bedding area there's an aha moment when you walk in there you're gonna go wow uh, you know this deer's got it made how do I get near this thing this is the perfect spot you don't do that with doe bedding areas when you walk in there and it's a buck bedding area uh, you can feel that sense of, of, of there's a lot of thought process that goes into picking this spot maybe there's not but you get that feeling well, let's talk about the thought process there because, you know, we were talking to a guy named Ben Rising in Ohio. He killed some really big deer and he was like, you know, I try to think about deer like a stupid goat, but a really smart <laughs> thing at the same time because there's different processes there mm -hmm. in their mind. And that's one of the things we kind of like have gotten different people's opinions on is the fact that how does a deer find that area? Mm -hmm. Is it process of elimination? He he tries it out as a two-year-old and learns that hey, I'm I'm pretty safe here. Like in your mind, how does a deer start to recognize those areas? I think it all has to do with um, wind and uh, uh, predator scent. I mean, um, when I look at a property like say this public property, I'm not looking at deer habitat like other people are. I'm looking for the overlooked spots. I can take a map of this property and cross out 90% of it and. I'm only going to look at 10%, and that 10% will hold all the mature bucks. I should say all of them, but most of the mature bucks will be in those little pockets that people overlook. The majority of the big ones I shoot on public land are right next to parking lots, right alongside roads, places people forget about. So when you're talking about that 10%, how do you identify, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on, this is what I'm not? Um, by thinking about where people would go. Gotcha. Um, people are pretty predictable. They're more predictable than the, the deer themselves. So if you, if you can figure out where the people are going, the deer are on what's left over. Gotcha. 
and that's not like a I mean are you adding into that like terrain features and transition lines like okay I know people probably aren't gonna go over here and there's a transition line in there mm -hmm. I'm gonna go scalp that is that yeah okay. like this particular area here is very heavy pressure in southeastern Wisconsin we're right between Milwaukee and Madison uh, we've got a lot of big cities right around us Oconomowoc and we've got a lot of pressure around here a lot of guys mm -hmm that hit this, this property. I mean, this whole parking lot will be full. And these guys are gonna go out and they're gonna cover this landscape. But you know what they're gonna avoid? Water. I don't know why, but they do. They won't go through water this deep. And they got rubber like boots swamp on. Swamp water or like a creek? Like swamp water, yeah. creek, either or. Anything they got across that's wet. And if I can find those isolated patches that are wet like that, that hold deer. And usually for me, it's an area that holds water, like swamp, that has water in it, but has high ground in the center of it like a small island or something, that'll almost always hold good bucks because that's where people don't go. Gotcha. So let's talk about feeding patterns real quick because one of the things that I think is essential in your system mm -hmm. of hunting, mm -hmm. and if anybody hasn't followed your system, there's a ton of information out there. And I don't want to really just dive into all the stuff you've already talked about in different places, but let's talk about when that buck's leaving his bed, mm -hmm. does that trail stay consistent as his food sources are changing throughout the year? No, mm -mm. no, he'll uh, he'll leave in the direction he wants to go towards food, and uh, that's a big thing, a misconception. I hear this a lot from people, is that uh, they always move with wind to face, or they always move with wind to back. There's people that got different theories. Those people are seeing that because that's how they set up. Because I set up in a variety of ways and I don't see any pattern for how deer leave beds. I see it when they come in, but not when they leave. Um, as far as your food patterns go, uh, right now, for instance, um, the acorns are dropping real heavy here. So I'm looking for those primary bedding areas that are right up against oaks. Um, they kill me in the hills. Uh, Western Wisconsin, when I go in the hills, acorns everywhere, I don't even want to be there. I'll go back to the swamps because they're, they can just get up and feed. But here in a swamp or a marsh, uh, those acorns are real isolated um, because most of the ground can't hold an oak tree. Mm -hmm. So I'll go and I'll seek out those isolated patches of oaks that are really close to really good bedding and I'll get on the side of the bedding that's on the side of the oaks. Well, hunting big woods timber in the hills is kind of like close to my heart mm -hmm. and that's one of the things we're constantly pounding our head against concrete walls like, okay, I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on all this other stuff, but these freaking deer go anywhere that they want mm -hmm. as soon as they leave their bed. There's, you know, last year we had a huge chestnut oak crop. It, advice for that kind of situation. So, and a lot of the eastern part of the United States is like that. So guys hunt West Virginia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Maryland, um, New York, places like that, where they're in those mountainous, hilly type country. What can you do? I mean, are you waiting to the rut? I mean, how are you hunting those areas when you know it's a mass, good mass crop year? Well, it depends on what you got. You know, for me, I would make sure I had lots of ground. Mm -hmm. So I hunt a lot of public. Even if I have private, I still hunt public so that I can get out. Mm -hmm. And I would just burn some bridges. I'd go in there and hunt them, push as close as I could to those bedding areas and hope they move far enough. Uh, look for a hot day and find a water source that's up on one of those ridges. Um, but you gotta push that bedding because they're not gonna move far when those acorns are dropping. Uh, in Wisconsin, we got a wide variety of terrains. We've got hills, we've got big woods, we've got swamp, we've got marshes, uh, we've got farmland. Um, so for me, the ideal situation is early season, I like to be in marshes or swamps because I can really push those bedding areas and I can find them isolated near the oaks. And then come rut, I like the hills because you can really get them to move on those leeward ridges. Um, and then come late season, I like the farmland because if you're on the right property, you'll have all the bucks flocking to the food. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, I mean, you probably have access to a number of different properties in those different locales. So is that kind of how your strategy for the season goes? Is like going to those different eat, different spots? Is it probably should, but uh, at my point in life, I'm more targeting a certain animal or, and doing it for different reasons. But if I was out there just to kill big bucks, with, which is what most of the guys watching this are probably gonna yeah. be doing, is I would be following that target pretty closely to what I just said. Understood. Let's talk about targeting a specific deer. You had mentioned you've got deer this year that you've kind of know of from years past that you'd like to catch back up with. 
how do you hunt a specific deer without getting too aggressive and potentially blowing your chance, you know, on the first couple sits? I mean, how? what's your strategy for hunting a specific deer? A lot of time it's, uh, I'm pretty aggressive, but it's a, a lot of it's observation stands. Like I'll observe an area from a distance from a real high tree and burn a hunt that way before I move in. Hoping to learn something about. Right. And uh, I'll, I'll just keep creeping that until I, I get a sighting on them. Um, but like I said earlier, those big bucks are kind of hard to kick out of a core area. Yeah. A lot of guys think, well, if I put too much pressure on him, he's going to move to the neighbors or something. Um, maybe, but probably not. And you're certainly not going to kill him by being passive. Yeah. And to me, if you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching them. You know, if you get not quite close enough, he just learned that you were in there. Because he's going to come through and he's going to smell you. No matter what you do, he's going to know you were in there. Yeah. So he knows he's being hunted. And you're just, you know, uh, slapping him on the ass and saying, hey, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm on you. Yeah. I'm hunting you. Yeah. You know, I like to catch him really by, by an aggressive move. So if I, I sit back and watch, but when I go in, I'm right there. I'm right on the, on the door where he comes out. You think for every year that you hunt a deer that you don't kill him, it's that much... You have that much more knowledge to go in the next year knowing what he did last year? Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I do. Say, okay, here's another situation that we, uh, we've talked about several times throughout this series. And I know that you have done this type of thing. Like, we've talked to certain guys who I know are like habitat guys. They hunt the same farm every year. But for somebody like you, or I can imagine if we talked to Andre or Cody or um, somebody that's kind of more aggressive in their hunting style, the scenario of okay, I've got I'm going into a new area. I haven't been able to scout it. I've got seven days. Say it's a marsh area like this. Mm -hmm. What is your how much emphasis do you put on scouting versus starting to hunt? I mean, what what would be your strategy for a situation? If like I had that? seven days in an uh, in a property that I'm not real familiar with, the first thing I'd do is I'd study some aerial maps on it. Go back in historical maps and really study it and study topos. And I would take some educated guesses on where I think those deer are. And then I'd go out there with those maps when it's time to hunt. I wouldn't pre-scout. I'd put that stand on my back and I'd walk those areas, creep in the area where I would hunt, looking for sign coming out. And if there's no sign coming out, I can, I can assume that my uh, guesstimations were incorrect and go on to the next one. And uh, I actually do a lot of hunting like that and uh, I'm pretty successful at it. You just have to know when to hunt and when to move on. Understood. When you're scouting like that, on the, you know, being mobile, on the move, trying to figure something out, how are you scouting? Are you scouting wind in your face? I mean, what is your, what is your tactic for scouting like that? Uh, if I'm scouting to hunt, I'm going to hunt that night. I do not want to put up a stand and come back the next day because then the deer is going to know I was there. So I'm, I'm hunting that day. My only concern is that I don't walk where that deer is going to walk and that my scent never hits where he's at. That's really my only concern in finding a, a spot. But um, I think you'd probably be a little surprised how I go into those spots because I really go in slow. Once I know I'm hunting there, I'm sitting back, really kind of watching where I go and looking from a distance, trying to pick a tree, trying to look for signs, see if there's rubs coming out. Or um, You had said you and Mario got in a situation one time where you had deer all around you on the foot as you were going in to just kind of scout. I mean, does that kind of stuff happen a lot? It happens a lot. Um, if you get a, a really good primary bedding area, um, it has what I call satellite bedding, where uh, a lot of deer will go there to bed, but the, the more dominant bucks are going to take over the center, and the younger stuff just ends up out in the, the outskirts, and you end up kicking that stuff moving in. And uh, that gets to be a challenge, too. Yeah. Yeah, you had talked, I, I watched one of your recent videos, you were talking about bumping deer and not not seeing that as the end of your hunt. Mm -hmm. Because just because that deer runs past, you know, doesn't mean that that big buck's going to get out of his bed. I mean, right. I, one thing I feel like I noticed, the more I watch deer, the more they'll spook for reasons that, you know what I mean? Like, you'll watch them turn their head and run from something and there's nothing even over there. Yep. And I feel like that happens a lot. What, um... What's your favorite time of year to hunt? Let's talk about that. Uh, you know, I like early season a lot. Uh, this time of year, um, I don't know, it's just something about uh, that, that uh, you know, late summer, early fall time period of, of uh, 
where you could slide in there close and they're still in kind of a summer pattern. You, uh, I mean, if you look back on all the big bucks that you've killed, I mean, what would you say has been your most successful part of the season? Would that it would probably be a toss up between early season and rut. Uh -huh. um, but I think the very biggest ones uh, have come from uh, early season. Uh -huh. And the reason that is, is, is because uh, they don't run wild and do the rut things that the younger bucks do. I think a lot of people that kill big bucks during the rut are really killing three-year-olds or four-year-olds and not really the mature ones. And I think the most vulnerable time for a mature buck, like five or older, is that early season time period when uh, they're still feeling safe about moving around in thick cover near their bedding area where it's green and... Yeah. What are your thoughts on the move? I mean, have you seen any kind of correlation? I'll tell you, um, I used to believe there was nothing to do with the moon. I thought it was all pixie dust and hogwash. And uh, I used to debate with Andre Diaquisto about that quite a bit. And he, he would argue with me that, no, no, it, it, the moon is everything, you know. And, and uh, he had me over by his house, by his farm, and he started showing me these pictures. And all the pictures correlated with moon, the movement of, of the overhead or underfoot. You could see, you know, now his deer aren't as pressured now. But you'd see three in the afternoon, you got a moon overhead, and the deer are out in the field. But they certainly weren't when the moon wasn't overhead at three in the afternoon. You could, you could see a timing with that. But what I, when I started paying attention to it here, it was really hard to notice in these swamps and marshes. But where I did notice it is when I went to the hill country in western Wisconsin. I don't know why, but it seems like some areas it affects it more and some areas it don't. And maybe it's pressure, because this gets a lot of pressure. You know, and that, the hill area doesn't. That's what I was telling some of those guys. It's like, you know, I've been the biggest skeptic of the moon. And there have been like three or four instances over the last couple of years where I've been like, kind of like, you know, calling out like, okay, moon, <laughs> if you're, if you're so real, you know, then on this date, last year, it was November 4th, it was late October, and there was this big deer I was hunting. I was like, all right, if the moon's real, November 4th, you know, he'll be on the scrape line that he always hits at 5.30 shot that deer 533 on that scrape line mm -hmm. and it was like wow yeah and you know what i've seen is, is when i go to western wisconsin hunting those hills is i'll take a week up there and i'll mark down when i see deer and maybe i see 30 deer in a week and 28 of them are within one hour of that moon time right. wow and you think that that can't be just coincidence yeah you i mean do you um have you since you've kind of been watching that have you, because I talked to Cody a lot about this, about how he slips in the mornings to catch bucks on an overhead moon in the morning. Mm -hmm. Have you tried that much since then? Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, I don't have as much luck here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if I have a moon phase difference here, the reason I'm not seeing it so much is because you will not see a deer out here at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You won't. Um, these deer are really nocturnal. So I'm seeing them that last hour of light and that first hour of light. Um, especially the mature ones. So that moon influence is probably there, it's just not as much. Um, in the mornings in the hills, I have a lot better morning hunting when that moon is overhead in the morning. Uh, here, not so much. 